Hello Ethical Hackers! Today I will share with you my process of solving an awesome CTF organized by HackerOne. One of the objectives I had this year is to get invited into a live hacking event. In an attempt to achieve this, I accepted the challenge of solving the HackerOne 2006 CTF. During the process, I had the chance to practically exploit vulnerabilities I had only read about. Besides, I enjoyed writing custom scripts to automate some tasks, and finally, I learned how to use some advanced features of the tools I commonly use. The first step is checking the scope. This is crucial to avoid any testing of out-of-scope assets. In the policy page, the wildcard domain bountypay.hackerone.ctf.com is all in scope. Running Asset Finder and HTTP Probe on the target reveals the following web applications. For each web application, I performed a light directory brute force to spot any low-hanging directories using fuff and the quickhits.txt word list from the Seclists project. Several interesting folders were found, as you can see. All the subdomains are directly accessible, except for the software subdomain, which returns a HTTP 401 status code, which indicates that it might be restricted to internal users only. This will be useful later. The directory slash dot git slash config seems to be interesting, as it usually holds details about the code repository. Fetching it using curl reveals the following highlighted GitHub remote origin. The request logger repository contains a PHP file which logs HTTP requests into a log file named bpwebtrace.log. Indeed, fetching that file reveals some base64 encoded content, and the following one-liner grabs the file and decodes it. As you can see, the logs disclose plain text login credentials of the user brian.oliver. A certain challenge answer is there as well, and a request to the slash statement endpoint is visible. For now, we are interested in the credentials. Using the previously gathered credentials, I log in to app.bountypay.hackerone.ctf.com. However, there is a two-factor authentication feature preventing me from signing in. Looking at the POST request which is used to send the 2FA code, I noticed a POST parameter named challenge answer, which I previously gathered from the logs. However, it was tied to another POST parameter named challenge, which seems to be an MD5 hash. Luckily, the challenge parameter was simply the MD5 hash of the challenge answer. Therefore, it is possible to completely bypass the 2FA feature by generating the MD5 hash of the string BD83 blah 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 and sending it into the 2FA request. As you can see, access to Oliver's bounty pay customer dashboard. Can Oliver pay May's bounties? Unfortunately not. However, loading the transactions triggers a request to the API, which is one of the assets found during the subdomain enumeration process. The following request shows a call to the API slash accounts endpoint with Oliver's account. Notice the account ID which starts with F8GHI. It is appended to the API call and this will be useful shortly. As you can see, the session cookie is a base64 encoded JSON containing Oliver's account ID and a hash. Since the account ID is used as part of the endpoint to the API, we can attempt to pivot inside the bounty pay infrastructure through the app subdomain. From the subdomain enumeration step, we found that the API had a redirect endpoint. Besides, the API allows redirection to some internal subdomains, including the software subdomain. When we performed directory brute forcing, I mentioned how the software subdomain was restricted. What if we could access it using this redirection? Using the following token, value, 
we can perform path traversal and call the API's redirect endpoint through the Bounty Pay customer application. This time, the response status code is 404, not 401 anymore, which means that we have successfully bypassed the authorization restriction. I wrote the following script to perform a light brute forcing using the wrapped small directories word list. It takes the token and appends the directory and then base64 encode everything and then sends it to the server as part of the session cookie. If we find a hit, we print it. Running the script reveals the existence of a folder named uploads, which contains the bounty pay.apk file. This request with burp suit confirms what the script has just found. The APK file was directly accessible from outside, which makes it easy to download directly from the software subdomain. From there, I ran d2g-dex2jar to generate a jar file from the APK. Then, I used gdgui to load the jar file and inspect the source code. Furthermore, I ran APK tool to decompile the application's archive. Upon installing the application on my spare phone, the first screenshot of the application asked for a username and an optional Twitter handle. When we click Next, the Part 1 activity appears. Unfortunately, it's just an empty activity with a button. When clicked, it shows hints regarding deep links and parameters. Inside the decompiled folder we generated earlier using APK tool, the Android manifest.xml file reveals that this activity has an intent filter, which means that it's directly reachable. Besides, the data URI is expected to be of the form one column double slash part. Furthermore, looking at the source code using the previously mentioned GDGUI shows that the activity accepts one parameter named start. When it holds the value part2 activity, the application sends an intent to the part2 activity. Using the activity manager, I can send the expected deep link to land on the part2 activity. The following command makes the application jump to the part2 activity. Same as the previous activity, this one is also blank, at least at first. Inspecting the Android manifest file once again confirms that it also accepts an intent, this time with a scheme set to the value 2. The code expects two parameters, 2 and switch. When they hold the values light and on respectively, I can show some hidden UI components. Again, Using the activity manager, we send an intent to the activity. And suddenly, a hash value and a user input get revealed. Cracking the hash on crack station gives the value token. Besides, inspecting the source code shows that the activity expects the input to start with the prefix x dash. Taking the hash value as a hint, I simply entered the value x dash token in the text box, which effectively allowed me to access part 3 activity. Inspecting the Android manifest once again for this activity reveals that it expects a scheme with the value 3. Besides, reading through the Java code shows that it's expecting three parameters this time 3, switch, and header. When they hold, a base64 encoded string part3 activity and a base64 encoded on string and x dash token respectively, the activity will show some hidden components. The following command provides the activity with the right deep link to show the hidden components. When inspecting what has changed in the shared prefs slash user created dot XML file, I can see a new element containing a hash with the value that starts with 8E9998EE. When I use it in the now visible input, I land on the congrats activity with a button containing a hint that the new revealed hash will be useful in the next steps.
Based on the perform post call function from the source code of the part 3 activity, I noticed that the API accepts a post request and a x-token header containing the value I have just leaked from the user created file. So I conducted a light brute force, this time using the x-token header. The following command reveals the endpoint slash API slash staff. And indeed, it reveals two staff members along with their name and staff ID attributes. Using the post request with those attributes shows the error staff member already has an account. This means two things. First, I have found the right parameters. Second, I need a staff user who is not registered yet. And for that, we need a little bit of open source intelligence. In fact, BountyPay owns the Twitter account at BountyPayHQ and they follow the user Sandra A767 blah, 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 who has just started working on Bounty Pay. This account is owned by Sandra Allison, a fresh employee of Bounty Pay. Maybe she hasn't been registered in the staff application yet. On a tweet of hers, she posts her staff ID, which is what we need. As a result, the following request shows her plain text credentials, sandra.allison, with the password that starts with s% 3d blah 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 blah. Sadly, Sandra cannot perform privileged actions. The set of features is limited to displaying one ticket, reporting pages to the admin and updating her profile name and her avatar. And to achieve a privilege escalation, we need to understand few things. First, in the slash js slash website dot js javascript file, the endpoint slash admin slash upgrade where username seems promising. However, Sandra doesn't have the right to execute it. Besides, the JavaScript code shows tabs in the user interface based on their respective HTML class. When the hash location contains one of those classes, a click gets triggered. Second, testing the update feature reveals that the avatar value gets inserted into a HTML class. For example, setting the avatar value to upgrade to admin space my class Sandra's avatar would contain the classes upgrade to admin and my class. Third, the login page reveals that it accepts the parameter username, which gets inserted into an input field named username. The path should look like slash where template equals login and username equals whatever username. This will be useful when I combine everything together. Finally, during the testing of the template get parameter, it was possible to include multiple templates using an array. For example, the path slash where template array equals login and template array equals home would load both login and home templates in one page if we want to combine everything. What if we can cause the admin to trigger the update feature using the observed behaviors? To achieve that, we can inject the upgrade to admin and tab4 classes into Sandra's avatar. And to reflect the injected classes into the admins page, I can load the ticket template with the ticket ID parameter. Besides, I can load the login page with the username parameter set to Sandra.Allison to populate the username parameter with Sandra's username when the click triggers. And to trigger the click, I can append the tab4 hash to the path. Finally, I can report the rendered page to the admin so that the upgrade request triggers on his or her end. The following single request can achieve the desired outcome. To report this page, we can simply base64 encode the malicious path above and send it. As you can see, we get the new session cookie with the admin privileges in the HTTP response. Therefore, we see a new admin tab appearing, which contains the credentials of Martin Mikos. 
Sadly, the two-factor authentication kicks in once again when I log in as Martin. However, using Oliver's challenge and challenge answer from the first two-factor authentication bypass works for Martin as well. A new session cookie is provided which allows access to the customer app as Martin. Therefore, I can finally see May's bounty transaction. Unfortunately, the payment requires yet another layer of protection using two-factor authentication. Part of this feature involves a POST request containing a parameter named app underscore style, which points to an attacker-controlled CSS file. I host the following CSS file on my server. If the body element exists, which is most likely the case, I will receive a callback on my server to slash body. I use ngrok to handle the incoming requests. And sure enough, I successfully get the callback as shown here. To discover the HTML content, I wrote the script below to assist me at guessing virtually any part of the target HTML page. It takes a string value and an attribute name as input, generates the malicious CSS file and sends it to the server. Systematically probing the HTML using the script above, I found that there is a div with a class named challenge area and seven input elements with the name code 1 through code 7. And for those codes, I get the callbacks as you can see. The final exploitation. Once again, I wrote the following dirty script to perform an end-to-end -end exploitation. It builds a CSS file which contains all the possible CSS selections targeting the code input fields. It sends the CSS file and grabs the challenge and the challenge timeout values from the HTML response. It extracts the seven characters and builds a full string out of it. And finally, it sends the exfiltrated challenge answer along with the challenge and the challenge timeout values to the server. The step 4 is configured to run through my burp instance to see what happens. And lo and behold, I finally get the satisfying HTML response containing the flag. This write-up describes a smooth path. However, the reality was totally different. In fact, the write-up doesn't include rabbit holes I fell for when I was looking for ways to pivot inside the infrastructure. It doesn't mention the long hours trying to figure out how to solve the Android challenges, and it certainly doesn't talk about the sleepless nights trying to escalate the privileges, write the scripts, and debug everything. I also had the pleasure to work with a friend, and now I understand why hackers discover such a novel bugs during the live hacking events. I encourage you to participate in such CTFs, as they are a really rewarding experience. Until the next content, stay curious, keep learning, and go find some bugs.